Jeremiah. So turn your Old Testament to the book of Jeremiah. We've been going through this book together. If you need a Bible, the ushers want to make sure you have one. Just raise your hand. They'll pass the Bible to you. You always want to see that it's God's word, not man's opinion or something that we're studying. So make sure you have a Bible. Turn your Old Testament to Jeremiah. Chapter 5 this morning. Jeremiah chapter 5 is where we're going to jump in. There is no getting around it. Jeremiah is a heavy book. It contains heavy messages. He is known as the weeping prophet, and for good reason. For what he sees and what God is leading uh, Jeremiah to see and to proclaim, it breaks Jeremiah's heart to see the people and the condition they are and the direction they're going. It's a loving God calling out to a very rebellious people. But because it has such heavy messages, it's a, it's a book that often turns out to be, or the messages from this book turn out to be heavy, strong messages, very convicting messages, uh, challenging messages. Yeah, it's always nice as a pastor to be able to turn to the warm and fuzzy passages, and everybody goes, oh, wonderful message and all. But that's not the whole counsel of God. And this one is part of it. And so we need to hear it as such. But always hear it from the same God that loves us so very much that he sent his son. And always hear it. That's why Jeremiah's heart's breaking. He knows God's love and he knows the people's turning from it and what the result of that is going to be for them. Well, today's passage is no exception to, to, to that whole theme of this being a very challenging book. But again, we're not to avoid it. As many commentators point out, that while this book applies to that time period, it also applies so much to ours, to our day, to our nation, and perhaps this morning to some of our lives. So we need to hear it as such. But again, make sure we hear all this as from the heart of the God who loves them and loves us so very much. We're going to jump in on our focus verses, go to the end of the fifth chapter, verses 30 and 31. Then we'll be going back and kind of looking deeper, but let's just set the table now. Jeremiah 5, starting at verse 30. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And now look at this. And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? My people love it that way. But what are you going to do in the end? It's a sad time in the history of God's people as we come to this book. A time of religious and moral corruption. The whole nation was involved in that. And God was calling them. But even though he called them and pleaded with them, they would not turn to him. They had fallen so far. We've talked about it before, but they had got into such horrible pagan practices. And I won't, it's horrible stuff. See, they thought they knew better. But now they're on the brink of some horrible consequences. But as God outlines their conditions, in his love we hear him ask, but what will you do in the end? I know you love it this way, but what will you do in the end? And that is an awesome, soul-searching question. For them and for us. I've called our time together this morning a horrible and astonishing thing. Let's pray. Father, there could be so many distractions, external and internal, in our lives. Right now, we've just cast all that on you. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us. What do you have for us? be a challenge, whether it's encouragement. What would you have for us in terms of 
outreaching to a nation in the condition that it is around us. Just in all this, Lord, speak to us, Lord. Help us to hear what you'd say, to heart hear it. And thank you, Father, that behind it all is your great, great love for them and for us. I thank you that you've, you're strengthening me to stand here. I thank you for all these you let me travel with, all the people here of our fellowship, the love we share with one another. I do thank you for answered prayer. And we look to you now, Lord. Take this text and have your way. It's your word from your heart. Help us now to hear it as such. In Jesus' name, amen. Think about it, what it means when God says something is astonishing and horrible. Strong words, aren't they? From God. See, chapter 5, chapter 5, really chapters 4 and 5, well, the whole letter, the whole book, really. But as we lead up to this section right here, uh, Jeremiah's just going through, he's itemizing all these things that just show us how far that Judah had fallen, the nation of Judah had fallen from God. Go back to verses 1 and 2 for just a minute of this chapter, just to give us a little flavor here. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, where God has Jeremiah say, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. See now and know, and seek in her open places. If you can find a man, if there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, I will pardon her. Though they say as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. God challenges Jeremiah. He says, go. Go through all the streets of Jerusalem. See if you can find one honest, right-on person. If you find one, I'll spare it all. But there wasn't any. Oh, they go around saying, oh, as the Lord lives. That's a saying they like to use. He goes, but they're lying. They speak falsely. They don't want his truth. They, they don't, they're not really walking with him. Again, they'd use his name, but were far from him. And throughout the chapter, the Lord continues to set before them why they were facing these horrible consequences. They had sown the seeds of their destruction. They had done all this. And again, we can't go through all, but go verse 23 for a moment. Kind of helps capture again some of the flavor of what God found. He says, but this people have a defiant and rebellious heart. They have revolted and departed. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God, who gives rain, both the former and the latter in its season. He reserves for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these things away, and your sins have withheld good from you. So that's the flavor. Matter of fact, I'll just keep reading. Let's look. We get down to our focus first. For among my people are found wicked men. They lie in wait as one who sets snares. They set a trap to catch men. As the cage is full of birds, so their houses are full of deceit. Therefore, they have become great and grown rich. They have grown fat. They are sleek. Yes, they surpass the deeds of the wicked. They do not please the, plead the cause, the cause of the fatherless. Yet they prosper in the right of the needy they do not defend. In other words, they look good. They're fat. They're sleek. They're prospering. But they don't seek God. They don't want God. They're not taking care of those who have needs. So what's he say? Shall I not punish them for these things, says the Lord? Shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this? And then we come to what God declares because of that. An astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. Again, think of what it means when God says, God's basically calling everybody, look at this. He goes, look at this. It's a wonder. Not wonderful, like great. It's just, be astonished at this, he says. I've taken care of them. I've blessed them. All these things I've done. And he goes, be astonished at the reaction. And understand, it's a horrible thing. So God declares now what those 
astonishing and horrible things. And you might be interested, you know, say, you might think, wow, what, what might be going on that God would say something's astonishing and horrible? Well, he tells us. We're going to look at them step by step. What does he say? What are these astonishing and horrible things? Verse 31. First, the prophets prophesy falsely, and then, and the priests rule by their own power. The people who are supposed to be speaking for God didn't know him. And they're putting forward lies, but proclaiming somehow that it was truth, but it wasn't. In essence, they were telling the people what the people wanted to hear. Look at back verse 12 for just a moment. Verse 12, speaking about all these prophets. They have lied about the Lord and said, It is not he. Neither will evil come upon us. We shall see, nor shall we see sword and famine. They're saying, peace, peace, when there wasn't going to be peace. And the prophets become wind, for the word is not in them. Thus it shall be done to them. So they're saying everything's okay, don't need to worry, we're doing great. We're not going to fall to the enemy. There's no consequences coming to us in all this. And the priests were ruling by their own power. They're in the position of being priests, not because God put them there. They put themselves, they, through their own power. They're, they're ruling over the people in their power, not God's. So the prophets are not true prophets. The priests aren't representing God. But then the stunning declaration. The two next sentences. I mean, it's just, look at that next. And my people love to have it so. Hmm. My people love it like this. See, the people were basically saying, tell us what we want to hear. Tell us how great we are. Tell us everything's okay. Tell us we're okay with God. Don't listen to this Jeremiah guy. Tell us how great we are. That we're the right on ones. Don't tell us we can't, do, can't keep doing our own thing. Don't tell us that we can't do what we want still not, and not have God's blessings, God's protection. So that leads the Lord to pose the question. And what a question it is. But well, what will you do in the end? Make sure we hear this with God's heart of love and concern. Because that's what's behind this question. He sees, he said, I see what you're building your life on. I see who you're listening to. I see what, what you're doing. Yeah, what's that, what's that going to get you? What's that going to get you in the end? See, the in this case, the people love to hear that they would not be conquered by their enemy. The enemy won't have anything to do with us. He can't get at us. No sword. He loved to hear that no sword would ever come to them. But it was a lie. So God asked them, what will you do when all that stuff that you were basing things on, thought were so, what will you do when all that doesn't turn out to be the case? There's a way that seems right to a man, but the way thereof is destruction. What will you do, he says, in the end? When the Babylonians come knocking on your door, and they do finally do that, but when the Babylonians come knocking on your door, what are you going to do then? When your enemy is defeating you, when you're taken captive, God says, what will you do then? See, it will do, it'll do them no good to trot out what the prophets had been saying. It'll do them no good to prod out, prod, you know, trot out what the, what the priest had been saying. It doesn't matter what all the people have been saying. It's funny how if we part of a majority or large group, we think we must be okay, everybody else is saying it. Everybody else believes it, it must be true. But what God, only, 
what the Lord is trying to set before them is it's only what God has said will have mattered. Only what he says will matter on that day. Are you getting really blessed? Are you enjoying it? <laughs> this is heavy stuff. I realize that. It's like, wow, pastor. But if we hear it from, it's been on my heart, if we hear it with God's love, it understands, you know what's coming? You know what you face? You know what's going on around you? There's a refuge. There's a strength. There's a provision. There's a place to build our lives on. But it's so much has to do with what do we listen to? Who are we following? Who do we believe? In the New Testament, Paul's exhortation to Timothy is like a fire alarm in the night. He warns of a coming day that sounds much like what was going on in Jeremiah's day. Let's remind ourselves of it. It's well known. Over in 2 Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Paul warns where there will come a time when people will heap up teachers that tell them what they want to hear. It's called itching ears. Scratch my ears. I want to hear something good. I want to hear that I'm okay. I want to hear there's no need to repent. I want to hear there's no need to turn from what I'm doing and receive the Lord. I want to hear that I don't need a Savior, that I'm good to go, that I'm basically good. I want to hear those things. They'll heap up. You always to heap something up. They'll heap up teachers. They'll gather teachers from all around that scratch that that desire to tell me I'm okay. They'll heap up these teachers. Why? Because they won't endure sound doctrine. Just tell us what we want to hear. Tickle my funny bone. Tell me some really funny stories, jokes, Tell us we're okay. No, again, no need to repent. No need to track with the Lord. You don't need to come to Jesus. You're okay. He loves you anyway. You're good to go. He loves you, but he wants to, because he loves us, he sent his son to die for us. An interesting thing, that verse 3 there begins with the word for which means because. So the whole admonition here is that because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, because the time will come when they'll heap up teachers that tell them what they want to hear, because of that, he says verses 1 and 2 right before this. Let's look at that. That's why he says this. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. There is an end. This age won't go on forever. This isn't heaven. <laughs> Praise God. I charge you, therefore, if he's telling Timothy, I charge you, I commission you, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. What, what did he say? Preach the word. I know they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear sound doctrine. But Timothy, here's your call. Just keep putting before them what I've said. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. And then he says, because, because there'll come a time when people won't want to hear it. And true in Jeremiah's day, and it's Paul's warning about times to come, which includes our time. But the remedy, he says, Timothy, just keep putting the word out there. Simply teach the word simply. <laughs> just keep putting out what I told you. What did Paul say? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. 
Oh, people will mock and everything else, he says. But, and they want to hear the guys that tell them how great things are and all. But you just keep telling them my love and their need. Now look at our text again in verse 31 in our Jeremiah passage. Who was it that loved it to have so? Who was it that liked it like this? My people. We might want to think it says, and those yucky Gentiles over there that are such a bad, they're the ones. No. He said, and my people, they like it this way. They don't want my, they don't want what I say. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to track with it. They want these people who aren't, listening, aren't speaking for me. And my people. So he's speaking to those that were his. They were his people, but they were far from him. They got to the place where they, they liked to hear how great things were and how great they are and all. They're going to church, going to the temple. They're people who go to church. But what were they hearing when they got there? And what were they loving? They loved it. So let's talk a little bit about that. I, like every other pastor out there, are called to preach and do what God's called us to do. And I'm not here to judge any other pastor. I'm called not to judge another man's servant. On the other hand, we are to be fruit inspectors. It's important we take a look at who we sit under and who we listen to. And not just on a Sunday, but in general. Books we read, all those kind of things. What, what are we letting in? What? So let me explain a few things here. There's nothing wrong with a pastor who uses illustrations or stories to drive home a point. They can be very important. I mean, the Lord himself used stories. He used parables to teach. Because oftentimes that helps us get it. A parable is to put a truth forward in a way that people can understand. Okay, I see what he's saying. Very appropriate. An illustration a parable. But be careful that whatever illustrations ever used or a story, that they do just that. They focus on the scripture. That they forward the point. That you go, okay, now I see what's being said. Unfortunately, be aware. Too often it's the joke that's remembered instead of the text. Well, the pat. Now, I'm not... This is speaking to the body of Christ in general, um, but important for us to make sure to think about. But if someone comes out of church and goes, hey, what, what, what was church about today? I don't know, but he told this really great joke. And he tell the joke. And he, what was the point? Not sure, but wasn't that funny? Then you say, wait a minute, something got out of balance. Years ago, I went to a wedding and after the wedding is over, all the people are ushered outside the sanctuary to throw the rice or the whatever you do now, bird seed or where they let you throw. And while well, the couple and the family stayed inside to get pictures, right? So we're standing outside the church and everybody starts looking and there was this really awesome limousine waiting for the couple. And I mean, this wasn't, it had a pool, a spa, and the whole thing in this thing. Well, of course, men being guys being guys, they start going, hey, look at this. And then people start, pretty soon everybody's over there checking out this, this limousine. The couple are long forgotten. The couple is, nobody's ever waiting. To, oh, look, and everybody's out, look at this, look at the TVs in this thing and everything. Sometimes an illustration can be like that. So the joke, the story's like, whoa. And all of a sudden that, and the Lord spoke to me that day, and this is way back in my, <laughs> but the Lord spoke to me and said, it is, basically, I felt like saying, Dale, be careful, because that's what an illustration can be. It can be so great that it takes away from the point you're trying to make. And so be careful. Appropriate to use them, but make sure they serve the bigger purpose of teaching God's word. Hmm. Too often, well, there's a danger. There's a danger of the style of the pastor being more um, admired 
than the Lord being adored. Oh, he's got, I like his style. And I mean, you know, we all like that deep, authoritative voice. Just, you know what? <laughs> this text reminds us popularity does not guarantee that someone is speaking for the Lord. All the people were loving it, but it wasn't God. Oh, man, they're flocking to this thing. Everybody wants to hear this, but it's not me, God says. Popularity isn't the gauge. If God blesses and has his hand on a particular fellowship and he grows and everything, awesome. But don't assume growth means that that's what's happening. Just, I'm just increasing God's encouragement. Use discernment and what we hear. Really sort out what's being said and am I being drawn to the Lord through it closer, you know, closer to it or am I leaving thinking about God and what he says or about the latest story or something? It is, an, it is uncommon for someone to share it with me or that I hear someone say that they heard a really great message somewhere. But I'll go check it out or people tell me, and the message isn't what the text was saying. Unfortunately, sometimes the text is just used as a stepping stone to put forward some pet viewpoint. But because they mix in a verse or two, oh, well, yeah, Pastor, it was scriptural. Well, they used that verse, but it just became kind of a pretense. It took it out of context, and it gets into something it doesn't say. Sometimes people present something as saying what the Bible says, but if you really look at it, you can see that they've slipped away from what the text is saying. So the admonition is just be careful. It's not sizes of gatherings. It's, it's not the popularity of the pastor. It's what's being set forward. But now having said all this, let's consider a couple applications. Those of you who perhaps, especially listening through the streaming or in here, those of you who perhaps you're considering the claims of Jesus, but you've not received, you're still not sure about some of that. You, you, if you've, maybe you haven't received what Jesus did on the cross for you. Now, don't hear this as a hell, fire, and brimstone, although those things are a reality. Here is God's love when he says, okay, I know that you, don't, you haven't received, but in love, I just want to ask you a question. What will you do in the end? If you don't choose to receive how I, this is the Lord speaking, if you don't choose to receive how I have set things up to be, if you don't choose to, to realize that I'm saying that God's, God's holy and we're not, and to be with him, something has to be done about sin. We sang justice and mercy today. I always love it when the worship team is in sync with me and I didn't have to tell them to play it. <laughs> but what's it say? God can't just wink at sin. Oh, let's just sweep it on the carpet and pretend it's not there. Okay, you can't come into heaven with that sin. But, I, but it's not just to just say, okay, it's okay that you did that. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay for it, God says. So where's justice and mercy meet? On the cross. Jesus was saying it clearly. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He's not saying that to say, and you can't come. <laughs> He's not saying to keep us out. He's saying, this is how you get in. You don't come in. You can't scale the walls from the outside. You can't throw a rope over and climb in yourself. But, here's, but there is now a lifeline thrown out. There's a lifeline thrown out. 
You don't go to heaven because you're a husband or wife or friend or child or parent or grandparent or grandchild knows the Lord. What's the saying? God has no grandchildren. (laughs) It's individual, one by one. You've got to do this. Lord, I'm a sinner. But I understand you paid for that. And you're offering to put to my account your righteousness and take my sin and put it to yours. Best deal ever. But if we don't do that, what will you do in the end? Well, I'll just hope my good gets me in. It's not good versus bad. It's not good outweighing the bad. There's no scales at the gates of heaven. It's not good outweighing the bad. It's not because you're so cute. It's not because you're so smart. It's because of the cross. What will you do in the end if you don't receive how he has it? But that's the good news. God has provided the means that we can know that we know we're heaven bound. That eternity is secure. You can travel through each day and knowing in the midst of everything we don't know, say, but I know that I know this. I'm his. And I'm headed home. And meanwhile, I have his presence every single day along life's way. But now a crucial question to consider. Follower of Jesus, there came an end for those in our text. An end in terms of how they thought things were going to be. That period of time did finally wrap up. They will be conquered. They will go into Captivity. <laughs> I know it's heavy stuff. I appreciate your tenderness. Just some for us to remember. And, but as I mentioned earlier, there's coming an end for us too. This age will one day be done. Now, if you don't know the Lord, it's like, whoa, scary. But if we know the Lord, we go, yeah, yes. Now, that timing isn't in my keeping, (laughs) nor in yours. I'm glad he waited long enough for me. So I'm glad he's in charge of when he's going to say, okay. And the trumpet blows and we're out of here and a new age starts. But the time is coming when that will happen. Ultimately, our lives will end one by one on our journey here, our time here. Or we're all going to be raptured out of here. Together, I vote for that one, but I don't have a vote. But one of these days, we're either raptured together or one by one, he takes us home. Whatever means he does. But then it says there'll be a judgment. (gasps) Pastor, what are you saying? Not a judgment about your eternal life. Not a judgment about salvation. That was secured for us on the cross. And when we receive the payment, when we receive Jesus... But there is coming a day that Jesus said, and he told us to be ready for it, because he wants us to hear something. There's coming a day when what we do in this life will be examined, will be judged by God. What will we do in the end when that time comes? Don't hear this. Well... For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it. That's the day when we get home, and because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work to see of what sort it is. For if anyone's work which is built on it endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. There's coming a day in kind of a calm vernacular, we're home. You're a believer. You're home. And what we've done, we'll put kind of an attesting fire, kind of like a conveyor belt going through the fire. It's an, exa- it's an illustration. But you put, all our works get in there. We're saved. We're good to go. But then all the stuff we've done gets examined. Now, a lot of people 
we have that sense of, you know what, as long as I'm there, even if I come out with smoke smelling on me, at least I'm home, I'm there. Even if everything gets burned up, nothing was for him, but at least I'm there. I just remember, ladies, if you're part of the women's Bible study, you heard a, <laughs> you're all nodding. You heard a really good study about this just this last week. Ladies, check it out. Go watch Kathy's message on this. I'm just doing a little re- condensed version. <laughs> Must be a theme God wants us to mention in the, around here. But there's coming a day when our Lord says we should seek, we should want to hear, well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter in. Enter into the joy. If Jesus, Jesus is excited about it, he wants to say, well done. He's got rewards. He might say, oh, I just want to be glad I'm there. But the Lord's saying, but there's more. <laughs> Wait, there's more. There, there's a, he wants to be able to have worked in a way that it glorifies him, and, and there's these rewards for it. He desires to do that. He wants to be able to declare it. That we, that he wants to be able to declare, hey, you built on me, you, you built on my word. You, you. And if we do, what will we hear in the end? What will happen in the end? Well done. To all to his glory. So what would you say the main point of our text this morning is? When you go out of here and think about it, you reflect back upon our time together, you think about this text. What's the main point here? Well, I'll leave that up to you to decide for yourself, but a couple of things to consider. One thing is be very careful who we listen to. Be a Berean. Check things out when people say it. Is that what the text really says? How does that illustration further? And Just make sure everything is tracking with God's word when you listen to it. Be careful the teaching we sit under. Whether it's what I share or anybody else, always say, wait a minute, is that what it says? What's God wants to say to me in this? You should always be that, Lord. Because when you gather, I hope, I, know, I trust you do. When you come in, you should always be thinking, okay, Lord, you know where I'm at. What do, you, what do you want me to hear? What would you have? What do you want to do? Comfort, challenge, convict, thy will be done. But we should always have that idea. Okay, Lord, what? And is that being facilitated, put forward by the teaching we sit under? So who do we listen to? Whose teaching are we listening to, being exposed to? And really, to think through our decisions. Because that's what he's saying. He goes, you guys are doing all this, but what's that going to get you? Where will that decision get me? What's the consequences if I take that route? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Holy Spirit, lead me in my path. I want to hear well done. Now notice this. Hopefully your Bible is still open. Jeremiah 5. Go to verse 10. In the midst of the declarations that God is having Jeremiah declare. You guys are being good students. (laughs) You're being very good students this morning. I'm covering a lot. Verse 10, Jeremiah, tell everybody these things. But then he also says, go up on her walls and destroy, but do not make a complete end. Go up on her walls, tell them what's coming, but don't don't prophesy a complete end to them. See, usually destroying the walls would signal you're done for. No more hope. A complete end. But now with the God of Israel. Tell them I'm going to do all this. But I won't be done with them. They will be back. They will be restored. They will be back in the land. And ultimately the Messiah. Is going to come. And deal with them. So even though there's consequences. I'm not done. There's restoration There's revival possible. And it's coming for them. But good news. Though they were like this, though there was a season of captivity coming for them, God says, but I'm not going to abandon them. Look down at verse 18 for a moment. 
Nevertheless, in those days, says the Lord, I will not make a complete end of you. So again, there's restoration revival in their future also. Perhaps you realize it's time for you to prepare for what lies ahead. Good news. It's offered. If you don't know him, you can receive him and change your destiny. If you know him but you're recognizing, Lord, I've been building on sinking sand. You can start building on the rock of the Lord. You can start offering every day to him that he might work in such a way that his will would be done. You can hear that well done, etc. The point is, if you recognize any of this might be challenge you about maybe what we're listening to or anything like that. Good news is, he's simply a prayer away. We can turn to each of us. He's, he offers himself to each of us, no matter where he finds us in all this, no matter how he wants to apply it to us. We can turn to him just as we are, right where we're at, and begin to experience his work, that restoration that he wants to do. Pastor Chuck Smith, who God used to raise up this Calvary Chapel thing, <laughs> he said this, but as we read Jeremiah, quote, but as we read Jeremiah, the real value of Jeremiah comes as you see a nation that is about to die and you observe the symptoms of that nation and the disease that has brought its death. And it will help you to understand very much as you look at the nation in which we live today and what's happening, end quote. Application for us, application. What do people out there want to hear? What are they hearing? What's being put forward to them? He says one of the main applications, and many commentators say this, is the application to our nation. Jeremiah wept. Man, had that kind of response upon us. Because what's our, what's our part in all this? Pray and share. Pray and share. And this week, we're going to have some awesome opportunities how to grow and learn and do that. Next Saturday, Pastor Nate, Kathy are going to have, a, and I've seen some of the stuff they're putting together. I encourage you, come out and check it out. It's going to equip us to be vessels in this world that needs to hear. Go the worship team up. Let's all stand. So there's the question. What will you and I do in the end. What were you going to do in the end? Good news. If we, if you, if we have received Jesus as our Savior, what will we do in the end? We will have an awesome homecoming. If we built our life on Him, if we simply allowed Him to work in us and through us, if we've walked this life available to Him, what we do in the end, we will hear, well done. So ultimately, if those things are the case, what will we do in the end? We will praise Jesus forever and ever. Heavenly Father, thank you. In your great love, you set before us the warning, the loving warning of being careful and checking out what we hear and all. Make sure it's track with you. Lord, give us discernment. Guide us. We ask you to cause the Holy Spirit to lead every step of our ways. Lord, work in us and through us all you desire. For us individually and as a fellowship. With all the great things you have going on, awesome things you're working around here. Change is coming, but good changes. Use it all, Lord. In the end... All glory to you. Strong stuff today, Lord, but help us to hear it from your heart of love. And thank you if that's the case. It's because you love us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, may the Lord bless you and guide you on your Jericho Road journey.